I can assure you uh, we stand with the people of Ukraine. It's bicameral, bipartisan. We will continue to be with you. We recognize you're at the front line on preserving democracy in Europe and throughout the world. So we uh, recognize the sacrifices that you are making and your people are making. And as Congressman Cohen pointed out, the pricing, prices that we're paying on energy today as a result of Mr. Putin's campaign swearly is on the shoulders of Mr. Putin. And it's a small price that we're paying comparing to what the Ukrainian people are paying for Mr. Putin's aggression. We have a very distinguished panel of witnesses today. Our first witness is Yuri Ventrenko, who is the CEO of Nafagas Ukraine, the country's largest energy and state-owned company. Over his career, Mr. Ventrenko has held several positions throughout uh, Nafagas, where he has focused on reforming the energy sector, ensuring Ukraine's energy security, driving market reforms, and promoting European integration of Ukrainian's gas sector. Between 2020 and 2021, Mr. Ventrenko served as the acting minister of energy of Ukraine. Prior to his work in the energy sector, he developed a robust leadership experience throughout the financial sector and in consulting services. Mr. Ventrenko, we look forward to your testimony. Dear Mr. Chairman and honorable members of the Commission, thank you very much for inviting me to share my views on this important and timely topic. Before I turn to the subject, I would like to thank President Joe Biden and the bipartisan support of the U.S. Uh, Congress uh, for America's unwavering commitment to Ukrainian independence and its territory uh, integrity. As well, the Ukrainian people are very thankful for the political, military, economic, and humanitarian support given to us during Russia's unlawful invasions uh, of Ukraine in 2014 and 2021. The European Union has developed a rather comprehensive plan to eliminate its critical dependence on Russian gas and oil, titled Repower EU. Although it stops short of making Europe wholly free from the Russian Federation, uh, but from the Ukrainian perspective, it's not the biggest problem with this plan. The biggest problem, and this plan allows Russia to continue enjoying enormous profits from exports of oil and gas to Europe, at least in the short run. Even though volumes of exports are falling because of the EU actions, record high global prices more than compensate for the volume decreases, and thereby Putin's regime is now receiving more money than it did for example, last year. Naftogaz of Ukraine, together with the gas uh, transmission system operation of Ukraine, submitted to the European Commission our detailed proposal addressing these and other problems. Some of our suggestions were considered, but not all. We continue our constructive dialogue with the European Commission and hope that it will soon consider the following suggestions from our side. Implementing sanctions against Nord Stream 1, fighting abuse of market dominance by Gazprom, in particular making Gazprom unblock flows of natural gas from Central Asia and transfer the gas entry points to the Ukrainian-Russian border, specific storage obligations for European importers of Russian gas. As a member of the International Working Group on Sanctions on Russia, headed by Andriy Yermak, head of the Office of the President of Ukraine, and Ambassador Michael McFall, director of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, recently presented the Energy Sanctions Roadmap, recommendation on sanctions uh, on the Russian Federation. Following the presentation of the action plan on tightening sanctions on Russia, we continued our work and prepared a document detailing energy sanctions, helping governments and companies around the world formulate proposals for sanctions on Russia. The application of energy sanctions should decrease the cost of invading Ukraine for Russia and help the Ukrainian state protect its territorial integrity, freedom, and democratic values. Unfortunately, so far, not all uh, of the recommendations of the expert group have been implemented. Further to the developing debates about risk and benefits, of different options for the sanctions, I would suggest considering a new, a slightly modified option of a transfer cap, whereby financial sanctions that would allow transfers of uh, payments from European off-takers of oil and gas sold by Russian companies 
to Russia only within a defined cap, a barrel of oil with a megawatt hour of natural gas. The difference between the full amount paid by of takers, presumably they will pay according to the prices specified in their contracts, and money transferred to Russia within the transfer cap will be frozen until Russia withdraws from Ukraine and pays reparations. The transfer cap should be set at a level that covers opportunity costs for Russian producers, but this level is expected to be times lower than the contract prices. As a result of the transfer cap, Putin's war machine will be starved. Russia will have a clear motivation to stop the war and compensate damages, while market disruptions will be prevented. In fact, we might see market trends opposite to the current trends, yet positive for Ukraine and for the free world as a whole. Russia will have to supply more to global markets while getting times less money than now because of the transfer cap. Besides, market prices will decrease due to increased supply. Natural gas is an energy source for heating for about 90% of Ukrainian households. That is why here in the, in the United States, we're discussing with the US government some very practical ways to ensure financing of uh, natural gas purchases of US LNG that can keep the lights on in Ukraine. I will be happy to answer uh, your questions uh, because I'm running out of time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your testimony. Your, your entire testimony will be made part of the record, and we appreciate uh, you, your summarizing in, in, in the five minutes. It gives us more opportunity to have uh, an exchange uh, with the members. Mr. Ventrenko, let me start with you. How do we get unity with our European allies to strengthen the sanctions, energy sanctions against Russia? Clearly, you'll have no difficulty getting Congress to take the most dramatic st steps we can to strengthen the sanctions. But tell me practically, how can we get our European allies to move in a more aggressive way on energy sanctions? Uh, thank you for this not a very easy uh, question, because we should realize that there's a very strong, for example, manufacturing lobby in Germany that likes uh, uh, dealing with uh, Putin's regime. Uh, because they believe it gives them some competitive advantage, unfair competitive advantage, for example, over U.S. businesses and other businesses all over the world. Although, frankly, I personally uh, think that uh, the German industry has other uh, competitive advantages, their engineering talent and their uh, future should not uh, be subject to Putin's uh, will if he allows Germany to be more competitive or less competitive. Now, to be practical, I believe that when we develop a sanctions package against the Russian oil and gas, uh, we should look at interests of uh, different uh, European countries to take them into account, but at the same time not to allow free ride and not to allow corruption. And there is still a problem uh, of corruption even inside the European uh, capitals. As a practical solution, for example, in this respect, uh, I would reiterate that this idea of a transfer cap, when we allow for a very limited period of time as a transitional uh, arrangement, some flows of Russian oil and gas into the uh, European, into the global market, but we would limit the amount of money that can be transferred to Putin. And in such a way, we would motivate, again, Putin to stop this war and to compensate for the damages that his aggression, again, caused. Uh, if it's implemented in such a way, I personally believe that there would be more uh, European governments on board. Uh, at least they would not have an excuse to their U.S. colleagues, for example, for not implementing so necessary uh, uh, sanctions against Russian uh, oil and gas. And just to conclude, as you mentioned yourself, uh, gas is currently the most important issue because oil is fungible. If it does not flow to Europe, it can flow to other countries. That's a separate question how to limit uh, the damage uh, of this kind of fung fungibility of oil. But natural gas can flow only to Russia because it takes decades to build new pipes, for example, from Yamal to China. So if Europe implements sanctions against Russian gas, it would immediately mean that Putin will get much less money 
uh, it would be difficult for Putin to uh, continue financing the war. He would lose support of his soldiers and, uh, again, general public support in Russia. It would make him stop the war. Mr. Yervitrenko, how is Ukraine doing? And maybe the ambassador could answer this as well, and I'm going to go to you first with its energy needs during this war. Um, I would just reiterate, by the way, how grateful we are for the uh, support of the United States, because it would be next to impossible for us uh, to fight against uh, this uh, brutal uh, force uh, without such support. Uh, but at the same time, for example, in the gas sector, um, because um, we were serious about preparing for the worst last year, uh, we, for example, Nafta Ga we turned the Nafta Gas around to, to make it Nafta Gas a profitable and financially healthy company. We also started to increase our local production at the end of the year, reversing the negative trends of the past. And that uh, allowed us to prepare uh, so that during the first months of the war, we were able to provide enough gas to all the customers in Ukraine. Um, maybe with some rare exceptions in some uh, areas with heavy fights where the whole infrastructure was just destroyed. Uh, we're still providing natural gas to some uh, newly occupied cities. Uh, we provide uh, natural gas supplies to besieged cities and villages in Ukraine. Uh, we also were able to provide uh, financial support to our customers during this last three months in the region of $3 billion. Uh, we can continue like that for the next couple of months, then we would need uh, some international uh, assistance. So, so far, um, I would say that in the gas sector, uh, Ukraine is doing fine. Ukraine is showing its strengths uh, and its resilience. Uh, but we would need, again, help for the next heating season, because Ukraine would need to import up to 6 billion cubic meters of uh, gas. Uh, at current market prices, it's about $8 billion. And that's something, that's a big challenge for Ukraine in the moment, but we're working now with the U.S. government uh, about finding ways, more commercial ways, again, expert financing, guarantees, uh, even uh, considering such an option as using gas as a part of a land lease that you, uh, the, the Congress, uh, approved. Thank you again for that. It's a, it's a game-changing uh, uh, effort. So combined, we believe that uh, we will be also to ensure that Ukraine is resilient, Ukraine this fight can fight this maybe prolonged war uh, against Putin. So the Ukraine war machine is not being affected by Russian attacks on oil? Ukraine war machine has been affected. Right. Uh, our oil, for example, facilities uh, uh, were destroyed. We had four two refineries. Uh, two out of two are basically destroyed by Russian missiles. Um, our oil product depots, our oil infrastructure, uh, unfortunately, uh, have been damaged significantly. Uh, but in terms of our gas in, uh, infrastructure, only again in those areas where there are heavy fights, uh, we are not able to continue supplying gas. In other areas, we continue producing gas, storing gas, transporting gas. Even some uh, brave European companies, uh, since the beginning of war, uh, brought some gas to store in our uh, underground gas storage facilities. So from that perspective, again, Ukraine needs help, but we are showing our resilience. Well, I, so you give me assurances about the people and being next winter and all that, but how about keeping the, the, the tanks rolling and the airplanes flying and, and, the, and all the convoys? Or do you have petroleum for that? And if not, where are you getting it from? Probably I cannot disclose all these state secrets because, again, providing fuel uh, for the military is a very sensitive area. Uh, currently, yes, uh, we've been able to uh, provide the necessary fuels uh, for the military, despite, as, as I said, tag targeted attacks of the Russian army. And also, the yes, our, our government helps uh, a lot on that. But I'm not sure that I can reveal all, all the secrets in this respect. Is, is Chernobyl f producing energy? Uh, no, um, and uh, again, uh, how about the other, concerns how about waste management facilities, uh, new, radio, radio, nuclear waste management facilities. And how about the other nuclear facilities in Ukraine? Uh, they're all producing uh, um, electricity, although we have a specific concern for the, uh, our biggest nuclear power plant currently occupied by Russians. Uh, we know that they're trying to... Uh, change, basically, to disconnect from the Ukrainian greed and connect it to the Russian greed. It's very dangerous. 
by the way, nobody can guarantee that uh, uh, nothing really catastrophic uh, uh, doesn't happen. It's the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe, and we've already witnessed barbaric, I would, uh, I cannot call it any other way, um, uh, attitude of Russian forces uh, in respect of this nuclear power plant. They shot from tanks at the administrative buildings with all the critical, again, uh, IT systems. Uh, and it was just, nobody could imagine that nowadays we can have uh, something like that happening when the whole Europe was on the brink of catastrophe. Mr. Vetrenko, uh, sanctions have been one of the key prongs of Western response to Putin's war of mass murder. What further sanctions should we impose on Russia to, uh, to indeed cover energy, and what actions would help Ukraine most to win? Thank you for the question. Um, our biggest priority at the moment uh, is to impose sanctions on Russian gas, because it's uh, currently the biggest uh, source of revenues uh, for the bloody uh, Putin's regime. Um, there should be a full embargo on Russian gas with only possible transitional uh, exemption, uh, but it should be subject to uh, this mentioned uh, transfer cap. So, for example, currently the price of Russian gas uh, in Europe, it's about $1,000 per thousand cubic meters. So it should be allowed to transfer only a small fraction, let's say $100, for example, to Putin, uh, to Russia, and the rest, uh, let's say uh, $900 uh, per thousand cubic meters, should be frozen on an escrow type kind of uh, account through financial sanctions that can be imposed by the United States and uh, the European Union. And with uh, technology such as floating terminals, uh, the, the ability to replace uh, Russian uh, Putin gas uh, could, could be done relatively uh, quickly, couldn't it? Uh, yes, but under this uh, exemption, again, one can expect that the Russian gas will still flow for this very limited period of time, while within a year, Germany has uh, a potential to uh, fully uh, replace Russian gas with, for example, US LNG, uh, Canadian LNG, supplies from the Middle East, uh, any other LNG, but also what is very important, for example, Germany can start importing Ukrainian electricity produced from Ukrainian nuclear power plants, even, even if they don't want to uh, develop their own nuclear power plants. We have now a surplus of electricity produced by our nuclear power plants and can replace 10 billion cubic meters of Russian gas should we be allowed to export our electricity to Europe. And it also gives money for the Ukrainian state, basically, to finance our resilience. So if there is a will, will there is a way. Uh, Germany should be even more serious about getting rid uh, of this critical dependence on, uh, on Russia and Russian energy. I, I appreciate your enthusiasm because it's, it's startling to me. It's uh, against their self-interest not to do this uh, long term. And uh, indeed, uh, the ex extraordinary ally that we have of Qatar uh, can uh, make uh, additional uh, production. And then, hey, I'm happy to hear of um, even a state like Maryland that there's a, a capability of uh, export. And so... Uh, and what do you mean even a state like Maryland? I don't think... Um, I know I'm over my time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so if you would like, I'll take other comments in writing or give them an opportunity to... If you'd like to respond briefly, we're trying to stay on schedule. Yes, sir. It's difficult to escape uh, this topic of secondary sanctions on countries that help uh, uh, Russia to evade, again, the primary sanctions. Uh, but I would suggest considering a mechanism of a special duty on imports uh, from countries that uh, help Russia evade sanctions. Uh, if such a duty is imposed by G7 countries, especially by the US and by the European Union, it would be a really good detriment for countries like, for example, India or others that uh, may consider, for example, a free ride uh, on uh, uh, discounted Russian oil. Uh, so that's, I mean, there's nothing uh, risk-free in this world, but at least that's something that is worth considering, I would say. And I would just comment, I agree with you on secondary sanctions. They're so difficult to get the European unity with the United States on those issues, but it's, a, it's a one that we've been work, wrestling with well before the Ukraine invasions with certain Russian sanctions. But uh, your point is very well taken on that. Representative Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Uh, Vitrenko, thank you for your testimony and thank you for taking time to join us today. Like my colleagues here, I'm disgusted by Russian's actions and committed to helping Ukraine win this senseless war of aggression by President Putin and his cronies. As chairman of the House Armed Services Committee and Intelligence and Special Operations Subcommittee, I'm especially focused on Russia's reliance on gray zone techniques to exert influence, whether that's launching cyber campaigns, spreading disinformation, or using energy as a weapon. Can you describe how Nafgas Ukraine has adopted over the months since the invasion? Also, are there any lessons you have learned that are helping Ukraine be more effective at operating in the gray zone from an energy perspective? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, again, although we have been warned about the risk of the war by the U.S. intelligence community and by the U.S. government, but of course it came for us as a shock again to experience this full-scale invasion at the end of, uh, of February. Um, at the same time, it helped us a lot that we, we uh, with the help of the U.S. government and uh, in general investing our own resources to prepare for uh, this hybrid warfare uh, by the Russian Federation, including, for example, to enhance our level of uh, uh, cybersecurity. But during the first uh, days of the war, we still needed, for example, to evacuate our offices from, from Kyiv during this battle for Kyiv. We had to evacuate our servers uh, and to move them into, cloud, into a cloud outside Ukraine. And over here, uh, we got a lot of help from the US uh, uh, IT companies, for example, you know, if I can call names, but like from Microsoft, for example, from Amazon, uh, from... Um, Elon Musk providing Starlinks, for example, uh, to uh, Ukraine that helped us a lot, for example, when we were evacuating offices and we needed uh, to have uh, a reliable uh, IT connection within uh, 20 minutes again. Starlink was the only option for us. Uh, so the lesson that we learned is that uh, because, again, we have to live with this risk of an invasion and full-scale invasion from the Russian Federation, uh, we need to be much more agile and flexible in terms of how we uh, manage our IT infrastructure, our critical infrastructure. And we also learned that, uh, again, a friend in, in need is a friend indeed. So we can rely only on the, uh, again, like best international companies, the USAT companies. We cannot rely on any providers of services uh, from the Russian Federation or from some other rogue regimes, authoritarian regimes. Because I cannot disclose everything, but we had some problems with some other suppliers from uh, such countries. Uh, the same, for example, with Russian propaganda. So the lesson we learned, and thanks for our, for example, uh, special services, uh, that many of the so-called experts that appeared on Ukrainian TV criticizing uh, the government, criticizing Ukraine, criticizing the West, uh, during the first days of war, it was clear that they were the Russian agents. Again, our special services, with the help of the U.S. intelligence, could trace a direct connection uh, to the, uh, the, the Russian special uh, service, to the KGB. So altogether, I believe, uh, allowed us to have these lessons how to be more resilient against the malign influence of, of, of Russia.